Okay. Well, today we are pleased to uh, to welcome Ken Tobin. Uh, he's the Chief Research and University Partnership Officer at, at Oak Ridge Associated Universities, and he's going to speak to us about 35 years of science and technology research and leadership at ONL and ORAL. Uh, holder of 15 patents, Ken uh, is known for pioneering ORNL machine learning methods for semiconductor device yield improvement and telemedical diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy and other blinding eye diseases. Amazingly, he has uh, licensed his, his patents and, uh, and copyrights to more than 20 uh, semiconductor device manufacturers and suppliers. Uh, his patents license for, for use in the early detection of blinding diseases remotely have saved the eyesight of tens of thousands of working Americans. Last year, he was selected as a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. And he's authored and co-authored co um, more than 180 total publications. As Chief uh, Research and University Partners, uh, Partnership Officer at ORL, Ken has been growing ORL research enterprise, expanding partnerships with the consortium's universities, and fostering business development opportunities with the federal government, national labs, and, and private industry. Before ORAL, in, uh, before joining ORAL in 2020, he served in numerous research leadership positions at ORNL, including director of the Office of Institutional Planning and the director of two research divisions, which were the uh, which are the the Reactor and Nuclear Systems Division and also the Electrical and Electronic Service Research Division, for, formerly known as INC or in Instrumentation and Controls. Uh, Ken earned his BS degree in physics and his master's degree, his MS in, in degree in nuclear engineering from Georgia Tech, and his PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of, of Virginia. Uh, his doctoral dissertation contributed to advancing computational imaging methods for neutron radiography. His list of awards is very long and I, I, I I won't go into them at, at fully, but a full list uh, of his awards are listed in the Oak Ridge or the, the article that announced this meeting on our website and also uh, will be on the YouTube video that, uh, that I will post of, of his talk. Let me just say though that his, that his numerous awards include American Telemedical Association Innovation Award, Patel Memorial Institute Distinguished Inventor, two R&D 100s, um, Tennessee Academy of Science, Industrial Science, Scientist of the Year. He's been a corporate Arnold cor corporate fellow. I that's that's all I'm going to tell you. You just have to read the rest. <laughs> Ken, it's uh, I just welcome you and please uh, please speak to us. Thank you very much. I have to make one correction. You, you, you said my undergrad and my master's was from Georgia Tech, and it was from Virginia Tech. So oh, good sleep, good sleep, well. Okay, I, okay. I, I miss. <laughs> so um, let me get you up here. But I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come back and speak with you all. I think I've spoken with this group. I know once, maybe twice, over the course of my career, uh, primarily when I was at ORNL. So I'm very happy to be be back here today. And to, um, you know, at, at this point in my career, it's not very often that somebody asks me to come and talk about my research and the impact I had and things like that. So I'm, I am absolutely looking forward to being able to do that today. Uh, some of this presentation that I'm going to show you about the research I've done, I actually had an opportunity to put some of this together for the, um, the ORU, uh, sorry, ORI's Postdoc Association. Uh, they had a big uh, uh, well, they have a meeting every year, but last year they asked me if I would talk to them about some of the intellectual property aspects of the work that I do. And I was able to do something similar for um, some of the ORI's, uh, sorry, ORU University members and such in a meeting before that. So uh, some of this I kind of had, but I, I think it's put together in a way that's hopefully is interesting to you. It certainly was interesting to me to do it. Um, and so, so here we go. 
So, um, <clears throat> can I walk around a little bit? People see me all right? I'm hearing. Okay. So, um, I actually started working at K25 in 1987. So, I moved here from UVA, my first real job out of college, and I was working with a group of centrifuge physics people. So, the centrifuge program was already on its way out, and there were a lot of um, activities going on which I consider now to be fairly entrepreneurial. You know, the whole idea of how could we take um, the development of instrumentation for uh, rotating, high-speed rotating equipment and use it somewhere else. And so this is actually a, uh, an example of uh, uh, work we were doing for uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and working with Pratt & Whitney and some others on developing probes and such that, um, that would work in a turbine engine, high-speed um, advanced fighter engines and these kinds of things. So that's, that's kind of where I got my start. I'm really an instrumentation, a signals person, signal analysis, image analysis, computer vision, computational imaging are the areas where I had interests and strengths. Uh, and so when I had an opportunity a little bit later, a few years later, to move over to the lab and join the instrumentation and controls division to help support, in fact, this is a, uh, one of the first uh, projects that were kind of image related that I had an opportunity to work on at the lab. And it was around developing um, inspection systems for the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and also the Postal Service, who were both trying to automate it, uh, more completely the uh, the capabilities that they had for for looking at very high speed uh, printing processes for U.S. currency and such. So um, during the whole kind of early part of the '90s, there was a lot of opportunity um, that came out of the fact that the National Competitive Technology Transfer Act of 1989 allowed us to create us. Um, cooperative research and development agreements with companies and with, uh, you know, bringing in federal partners and things like this. And so, you know, there's a few things that I was able to help spearhead. I think some of the earlier sort of CRADA opportunities and activities that went on in the laboratory. And so this was something called Amtex, the American Textile Partnership. This went on for five or six years. We were working with companies like Home Mills and Spartan Mills and Milliken over in the Carolinas. And, um, <clears throat> We also working through uh, BERE's, uh, what was at the time called the Office of uh, Industrial Technologies. Today it's the Advanced Manufacturing uh, and Materials Office, I think it is. And um, working to develop inspection equipment and systems, high speed, real time. We're looking at um, uh, the, uh, the formation of paper on paper machines. That was a Ford Rainier machine, it was called. It was used for making cardboard products. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens where the paper is very wet and forms and you had to try to be able to determine how to adjust the equipment so that you could produce a high quality product out of that. So that's kind of early stuff that I did. That was really before I got my stride and had an opportunity to uh, do some stuff that I thought was pretty unique. So um, the area where I think I made a lot of impact was, was as you mentioned, with the semiconductor industry. Um, looking at um, how to improve device yield. So device yields, it's a pretty simple concept. When you have a semiconductor wafer and you make a number of chips on it, all you really want to know is how many of those chips are good versus how many chips are bad. And um, you want to improve the number of good chips and use that space you know, very efficiently and productively so that you can make profits and things like this. Um, but of course, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is a very complicated process. There's many, many layers uh, that go on top of the uh, semiconductor materials and the transistors that are at the base. And so you have to do a lot of inspection. Um, and there's a lot of automation to that because you have a lot of product that moves through the fabs quickly. And you try to understand what's going on very quickly when the machine isn't working right, or a piece of a process isn't working right, and you have to try to improve that. Well, early on, <clears throat> when we were working with companies and industries, we had actually had an opportunity to do a trade with a company called KLE Instruments. They, um, they made equipment that inspected wafers for some of the big manufacturers. Uh, all range at the time was this whole technology called automatic defect classification. So there are a number of microscopes that would look at wafers that they would either take out of the process line or try to do it in the process line. And when they saw those defects, a person had to look at that defect and try to understand what it was, if they'd seen it before, what process it might've come from, how to correct it. And so they were trying to automate that process so they could they could generate information about their manufacturing process without a person having to review it. Well, at the time, um, there are a number of companies and universities and such, national labs, they were trying to develop these uh, machine learning type techniques to automatically identify what these things were. Um, but Semitech, the company we were working with, um, which was a consortium initially funded by DARPA that had members like 
advanced micro devices and IBM and Motorola and, and et cetera. Um, they, um, they really wanted to know what was best, what direction should they go? And so we talked Semitech because of our background and our work in computer vision into letting us do a, a benchmark study. Let's go talk to the companies, talk to the universities. Let's generate data from, from the, uh, the uh, Semitech fab that we could send to all the different companies and organizations out there and find out how these things are performing and what direction you need to invest in to try to improve them. And so it was really not so much of a, an opportunity for us to be creative, but it was an opportunity for us to, to get our foot in the door with the semiconductor industry, look at what they're doing, and then try to figure out how you could improve upon that or develop new techniques or what have you. So that was, that was really kind of the start, um, that whole uh, benchmark survey and study. You know, this is at the bottom here, this was the Semitech trans, uh, technology transfer report that we developed. They went to all the member companies, they went to all the suppliers that were developing these technologies, and they were able to understand kind of where they needed to go based on that. Well, that was cool. We enjoyed it. Um, but what we really wanted to do was research and develop some new things. And one of the things that we, we determined during that process was that, you know, a lot of these folks that are doing, they're, they're called yield engineers in a fab, and they are, their job is to figure out what these defects are. And so this, this actually represents a 200 or a 300 millimeter wafer. And all these little specs you see here are where the defects were. So a lot of times, instead of us, an engineer looking at a defect and saying, I think that's a particle that came from a something or other, they would look at the history or the, the, the distribution of defects and they would say something like, um, you know, on the top there, we have a random defectivity process. We've got contamination in our fab. We've got to clean something or whatever it might be. Or here, they would say, uh, these are things that we see uh, from a spin coder that puts a, a, an emulsion on a wafer before it's cured or etched or things like that. And there's some kind of contamination in that spin coder. Or this, something like this would be like a, a chemical vapor deposition process that had a contamination in it and it would be non-uniform the way it deposited it. They would say we've got a, a contamination there. Or something like this, which was actually, uh, these, these are little curvatures that come from this wafer being put into a boat of wafers, but, but it's being scratched by the other wafers that are in there. So you can kind of see the curvature. So they could tell a lot by looking at the signatures. So it's like looking at the trees instead of looking at, uh, sorry, the forest instead of looking at the trees. So what we did, we said, okay, so tech, we think we know how to address that. We could develop a, a, a classifier that would take these maps, wafer maps that you provide us, and it could help you assign labels to them and assign those labels to particular processes you need to go and fix. Well, it was a big hit. It worked very well. We used a, uh, just called spatial signature analysis. Um, uh, the other interesting thing about this problem is a lot of times these things overlap. They're, they're not discrete individual types of events that happen. So you, what you really get is something like this, scratches and scratches and CBD problems and whatever. And so the process that we developed would actually separate out all these different categories of things so you can see that there may be more than one thing going on at a time that you have to fix. And um, so we developed a classifier, a quick way to train, a quick way to generate result. Um, you could run these things uh, in an automatic mode. It would send reports to uh, yield engineers on an hourly or a daily or a weekly basis, whatever they needed so that they could understand the mode. Very positive. Um, so positive, in fact, that a number of the uh, companies that worked at Semitech said, we want that in our fab. We would like to license it from you. And so because of the nature of the, um, the uh, contract that we had in place with Semitech and Open International Laboratory, it was what used to be called a work for others contract. Now it's called a strategic partnership and, uh, program. Um, um, we didn't have the rights to royalties and things for those licenses, but Semitech got to do it. So if they, if they license it to one of their member companies, their member companies got to use it. If they license it to a company outside of them, um, then they would be able to collect royalties, but ORL didn't get to. And so we didn't like that idea. We thought, you know what? We've, we've got to have our own background intellectual property that we've developed that we can bring to Semitech. And so even though we were very successful with the number of licensees uh, and the kinds of things we were doing, we wanted to try and create something that ORL would own. So one of the things I, I think pop up 
quite a few times in here is that the national laboratories, you know, they have the laboratory directed research and development program, and they have the seed money program, which is kind of a subset of the LDRD program. And so we went back to the to the uh, the, the LDRD program. We said, you know what? We think there's another burgeoning field of computational imaging and computer vision um, and machine learning around um, understanding the content of images. And so we put in a request to get some funding to do something called content-based imagery treatment. It's the idea of taking images in a library and uh, describing them in some succinct way so that when I have one that looks like an apple, when I show it to the library, it brings me back all the images that look like apples. Or if I have an orange, it brings me back all the images that look like oranges. Well, there's lots of interesting ways to do that. We had particular ways that we, we worked with in order to do that using this. I mentioned the approximate nearest neighbor methods and things like this. Where we would find something. Else. So, so the other idea here is that these images come from all kinds of things. I mentioned semiconductors, I mentioned textiles, I mentioned paper products, um, and all these images, and you can't tell which is which here, but some of these are semiconductors, some of these are textiles, some of these are paper. And you know, so what you what you have is sort of a consistency in in the kinds of things you're looking for in manufacturing processes that aren't necessarily specific to one domain, right? And so by doing this and making some progress here, we were able to develop something that was really focused on manufacturing environments and the kinds of things that show up in manufactured products that you're measuring with camera and analyzing with a computer. And so um, we developed unique, a unique capability here. Um, we have patents on this, we have publications on this, and then we kind of went out looking for opportunities to do work. So this led to a lot of things, actually. Um, some of them were, were more, more um, um, visible in terms of uh, licensing and things like that than others, but it was all very interesting work. Um, so I mentioned the semiconductor work. So we went back to the semiconductor folks, uh, Semitech and other companies and said, we can help you manage those big repositories, libraries of defectivities that you're building. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images. How do you search them? How do you find something that's happened in the past? We can help you do that. We showed how you can tie those. So these little histograms over here are um, things like what lot number did these come from? What process layer was it on? You know, that kind of thing. And so we could really quickly direct a yield engineer to be able to go back quickly and find out where these things were coming from or where they had come from in the past and make corrections. But we had the opportunity um, to, to not just do this in the semiconductor industry, but we had the uh, we have funding from the uh, National Nuclear Security Agency, their NA22 program, which is an Office of Research and Development, um, looking at how we could do similar kinds of things to summarize and understand um, um, geospatial imagery. So imagery from satellites, or maybe you're looking for certain kinds of structures in a very large domain, and you want to find things that look like power plants or things that look like um, Air Force bases or things that, you know, whatever it might be, how do you do that? And so we are able to make some progress and get funding there. Um, we also were able to apply this in the biomedical industry in a couple of different ways. I don't know if you've heard the story about uh, Sean Gleason and Mike Paulus. They started a company to do small animal, animal uh, preclinical imaging with uh, PET scanners, uh, things like this. Um, so uh, they, they started, they also started a company out of Orin Hill, and then they came back to Orin Hill. They're both working there today, but um, their company was eventually picked up by uh, uh, Siemens Medical. And um, <clears throat> But that work that they were doing also generated a lot of information from, for example, small, uh, mice. So they were looking at things like this is a picture that came out of a study on polycystic kidney disease, and where you're trying to understand and characterize various kinds of states of disease or treatments or whatever it might be. And so the idea of being able to use this to try to characterize large repositories of mouse images, or, and this is one I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, looking at retinal imagery. So, we had an opportunity also, um, and in fact, this is back when Lee Reedinger was at the lab still, deputy s &T. Um, He brought a bunch of folks from um, the uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis over to, to Oak Ridge to meet and just talk about things we might be able to do together. And I was talking to a, 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 a doctor of, uh, of uh, ophthalmology. He was a PhD, MD. And he was working with patients who had diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, star guards, so all kinds of things that impact sight and vision. 
And he said, if I had a big repository of images, could you do something similar to try and automate the, the diagnosis of, of eye disease? So that was what led to our work with, with diabetic uh, uh, eye disease and, and a potential way to try to catch it earlier and make corrections. And I'll talk more about that. But the point is that LDRD that we did in content-based image retrieval for manufacturing, it was very, very positive. It allowed us to get into a lot of different work that went on for, for several years, many years. And some of that which is still um, uh, being used and is, it, it is a value to people today. And of course, there's a lot of work that's been done. Everything you see about AI and chat GPT and this and that, you know, all that stuff grew from a lot of people doing this kind of work back in the uh, 80s and the 90s, and the early 2000s. <clears throat> so um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the semiconductor device area, so that, that work that I was doing, I mentioned, keep showing you this picture, but it, it's, it's kind of indicative of what we're doing at the time. But that, you know, we were able to go back to Semicheck with that and say, hey, we've got new technology beyond the spatial signature analysis that we think would be very important to your yield engineers. And we'd like to do some work. So we got funding from Semitech to continue doing that work, but we brought with us the intellectual property and the background that we already had. So anything we could do in licensing and all was actually now the property of ORNL. So um, I've kind of explained to you what it does, um, but so in the, in the early 2000s, very early, we actually had um, uh, the opportunity to, to license this through the Semitech Research uh, uh, Consortium to a company called Applied Materials. Applied Materials is a very large uh, semiconductor equipment manufacturing company. They don't make devices, but they make the equipment that makes devices. And they were very interested in getting engaged, involved in yield management and inspection. Uh, they bought a couple of companies in Israel that were doing scanning electron microscopy of defects. In fact, these defects you see here are actually SEMs getting electron microscopy images. Um, and so, you know, they had a lot of automation that was going on there. They wanted to do things that would get into the industry in ways that others that were doing yield learning, yield management had not really accomplished yet at the time. And so they actually did a uh, $3 million <clears throat> SVP project with us. And we worked on that for several years. We got a product ready to go out the door and then 9-11 happened. And if you know the semiconductor industry, they were up and they're down. And when they're down, they're really down. They they lay lots of people off. They uh, stop producing products. They you know it's it, it, they really you know circle the wagons and close up. And then eventually they come back and they're out there trying to hire people and build and grow. Well, at the time they were shutting things back, so they got rid of the whole unit within Applied Materials that was developing this yield management product, and and gave the uh, the uh, the license back to us. Right, so we had it. Um, but we had also other companies. So there was a company, um, it, it was actually called August Technologies. They were soon thereafter purchased by a company called Rudolph Technologies. And August Technologies, their big claim to fame in the semiconductor inspection industry was they made equipment that didn't do, you know, very, very high resolution inspection, but they did kind of low grade optical inspection. And so they were looking at sort of bigger scratches or passivation layer problems or whatever it might be on a wafer but they still wanted to be able to categorize those quickly, those kinds of images and understand what they meant. And so they actually licensed the technology for this, um, I guess around 2004. Um, and then um, and, and continued to use that. We worked with them for a little while to get it integrated into their product line. And they used it all the way up until uh, 2019 when Rudolph Technologies was purchased by a company called Home2. And in 2019, they decided We've made up changes to the product um, that you know we would consider not ours and not yours, and so they stopped. But for a very long time, 2004 to 2019, they licensed that from ORNL. It was called True ADC, the product. Um, it fit into the True ADC Enterprise System, which is a yield management system, and it was very productive and successful um, for that company and also for ORNL. So if you look at this, uh, this is actually some information that Mike Pauls, who's head of tech transfer at ORNL. Uh, shared with me. He, uh, he actually gave a talk recently of, about the work they do at ORNL. He talked about this again. But um, if you look at the top 10 uh, uh, technologies that generate royalties for the laboratory in the last couple of decades, uh, the top 10 produced about 48% of the royalties for the lab. And this guy was ranked number nine. So I always thought that was kind of nice. 
to show that it was pretty impactful, uh, both in, in terms of monetarily and in terms of um, uh, the impact that it had on the industry and the company. And not to mention that, you know, the, the team, these are some of the team that were involved with some of this work back then, gets to split 15% of those royalties that come through. So for many, many years, we'd all receive checks every year, uh, really every quarter almost, for, uh, for stuff that came out of that. And so it was very productive, very impactful. It was really a, a nice way to sort of cap off that work that we've been doing with the semiconductor industry for, for a long time like that. So, uh, problems. so the other thing, I, so I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, the, um, if you think about that process for semiconductor devices, I've got a big image repository, and I want to find things that are just like it. This uh, physician at the Sorry. Health Science Center, his name is Dr. Edward Shaw. When he was talking to me, he said, well, if I had images of people that had various stages of diabetic eye disease, could you do something like this, not just to detect that they had it, if you're doing it in an automatic way, but also potentially stratify the disease, like tell us how severe it is, because that's how we decide when to do something. And the thing about diabetic uh, retinopathy is that there, there are things um, medically, surgically, that you can do to help um, keep it from progressing. So uh, I don't know if it's very clear, but so this is the retina, optic nerve, vascular arcades, uh, and in the middle here is the public health. This is where your high resolution vision lives. So anything that happens in there, that's where you have the highest density of collagen rods in your retina, and you can look at that. Like you can see, there's some exudates here. These are the little things that they're like uh, proteins that deposit in the eye when you have hemorrhages and you have micro aneurysms, which are, uh, they're caused by uh, leaky vessels because the diabetic uh, condition makes the vessels brittle. Um, and when they leak, the retinal pigmented epithelial layer, which is underneath the retina, pulls those fluids back out as quick as it can and it tends to condense these exudates out. And when those exudates pile up, they cause ischemia or a lack of oxygen to the, the uh, nerve fiber layer there, and those nerves die and you lose sight there. Once that happens, you can't get that sight back. So that the trick is to catch it early enough where you start to see these microaneurysms or even these major hemorrhages. And you can do things like laser surgery, which cauterize them and stop them. You also control sugar and diet and other things to help improve the outcomes of patients with diabetes. So if you can do it early enough, you can be successful in helping to prolong sight for a long time. The problem is there are uh, hundreds of millions of people who have diabetic, have diabetes, and many of those people have early to late, you know, stage uh, diabetic retinopathy and the potential to, if not the actual fact of losing sight along the way. And so we were actually able to go to um, the National Eye Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health, and we won a um, what's called a um, R01 award, the first one, which allowed us to do some, some studies with the data that we had from Ed Shom's clinic and some other clinics from partners we were working with, and show that we could actually achieve some level of automated detection throughput so that um, possibly, and this was the big idea, this is what we really wanted to do. You could take the diagnosis of DR out of the ophthalmologist's office and start doing it at a family practice clinic or do it at an endocrinologist's office or do it someplace that wasn't historically the place to be to go get your eyes looked at. So if somebody could do it very quickly uh, and, and um, save a, a patient from having to shop around and try to find where to go to get all these different things taken care of. So that was the idea, and that's kind of the direction we moved in. So we did really well with that, and then <clears throat> once we had some proof that there was potential here, we applied for a second round of NIH funding uh, to actually do some testing, to do some, um, uh, uh, to develop a network um, that would allow us to demonstrate the efficacy of this for, well, for the NIH at first. And um, so let's see. I think I skipped one. Can you go back one? Yes, sorry. So, um, <clears throat> so one of the outcomes of this was, yes, we had the automation piece, which allowed you to detect the disease presence and then stratify, stratify the severity of the disease. Um, but we also developed a, a network, a telemedical network that was HIPAA compliant. So it would protect uh, per, uh, uh, patient information, doctor information. 
and we um, were able to reach out through a number of funding agencies that help support the effort beyond what we were doing with the NIH and set up uh, systems at clinics in the Delta Health region, uh, Delta region, um, uh, all around Memphis. Uh, and we had a colleague that was over in North Carolina and we worked with her as well. And um, we were able to demonstrate a lot about how this could work, how it could be used to, to increase the, 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 the throughput and the follow-up and you know just the, the outcomes of people who had diabetes who were at risk of diabetic retinopathy and blind eye disease. Um, so we also had some very specific patents that grew out of that that helped support the, the whole concept, the, the network and the analysis and such. And I will tell you in, in all honesty, the, um, the uh, diagnosis piece, even though we could do that automatically, later on when I'm talking about companies and such uh, and, 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 and turn it into a commercial venture, it, it's a it's a real challenge through the FDA to use computer vision or automation, machine learning or AI to make a diagnosis of a human disease. You always have to have a doctor that does an overview. So if you're familiar with uh, digital mammography, you always have a radiologist or an oncologist that has to take a look at those. And a similar kind of thing has to happen. You don't have to have an ophthalmologist look at a retina, but you need to have a certified reader or somebody that verifies that decision that was made is a reasonable decision. And so that's that's still an issue today. But as as machine learning and AI gets better, as we can eventually show, and I think we already showed it, even with some of the data we had, that the machine learning system could perform as well as or better than a trained ophthalmologist, which isn't good enough, right? You can you can drive a uh, you can be in a self-driving car and you can have millions of road hours that are fine, but every time a car hits somebody, everybody says that technology doesn't work, even though 30,000 people die on the highway every year who drive themselves, right? So it's just a perception piece and we're gonna to get to that point. But as long as the technology works better than people trying to do that job, it's good technology and you should take it forward. So the technology is making it down that road, but it's not quite there yet. But this did lead to the startup of the company. So while I was at ORL, I was able to um, um, work with the Department of Energy, work with the UT Health Science Center, work with UT Patel, and license the technology to ourselves to start a company. Now, we didn't start that way. We actually worked with a bunch of venture capital companies. We went outside of the laboratory to try to make it available to others to license. And because of that sort of FDA issue and how automation how much automation you could really put into the technology. A lot of companies said, right now it's too risky. We don't want to do it. Well, Dr. Sharma and myself, we said, that's crazy. This is great technology. We want to try and do it. So we were able to license it from the lab um, <laughs> through licensing agreements with all three of those parties that I just mentioned and start a company, which was called Hubble Telemedical. And we started that in 2009. And um, we, um, we quickly, not quickly, but reasonably quickly, we were able to get uh, venture capital funding from a company called MB Ventures in Memphis uh, that allowed us to hire a CEO and a couple of software programmers and a couple of marketing and salesman folks and, and start a company, which we ran out of uh, Knoxville here for several years. Um, so it went on for about five years, I guess. Um, and then uh, after, after we made it to a certain point, we had sales, we had subscriptions to a telemedical service that um, allowed you to put this into uh, various types of clinics and doctor's offices uh, and provide uh, relatively quick results back from taking a picture of the retina um, by having a, we still had to have a physician overread or a licensed uh, reader that looked at your data and provided you with a, a verification of what the machine did, but it was still successful and it showed that it was, uh, a very marketable product. And so a company called Welltown purchased our company in 2015. Um, and um, just with about, within about a year, they were acquired by a company called Hill Rom, which was another medical company. And um, the, the, the cool thing about what Welltown was doing at the time, and then uh, um, Hill Rom adopted it was see this little camera here? This is a little fundus camera, it's a digital camera, it was very easy to use. 
Um, the cameras that we were using before were cameras that come from companies like Leica and others companies. They were $26,000, $30,000 a camera. This camera was about $5,000. So they made it more likely that you could get cameras out of the field to all these organizations that were going to be hosting this, uh, this telemedical review for retinal monitors. And so that also made it, uh, that wasn't our camera, but it was a good quality camera. It was low cost and it made it easier to attach it to our telemedical network, which we had created to help support the whole process. Um, and so, you know, from, from startup to purchase took seven years. Um, it's been working wonderfully as a product for automating and, and, and doing remote diagnosis of retinal eye disease ever since. And the kind of neat thing, this happened last year, last summer. Um, so uh, Hill Rom signed an agreement with CVS Minute Clinics in 2022 to provide the service to their Minute Clinics. And their Minute Clinics are all over the country. There's thousands of them. Um, and so at this point, when I say now we're impacting potentially tens of thousands of people every year who can get an eye exam very quickly, very low cost, uh, and very often, which is part of the problem with diabetic eye disease, is that people don't go. They go to their endocrinologist about their diabetes, but they don't go to see a doctor about diabetic retinopathy until they have vision loss, until they're having trouble seeing, then they go and get that checked out. Well, now when you go to your endocrinologist or you go to the, the minute clinic, you can get a test done in just a few minutes and get some kind of an answer or an analysis of where your, your state is for your eye. So very positive, very impactful. That's one of those things that we did that uh, it, it makes me sleep well at night. When I, when I think back about my career, and the kind of things I did that actually impacted people in a positive way, this is one of those. This is definitely one of those. I mean, the semiconductor stuff is great too because it, it's used. It, you know, semiconductor um, yield improvement helps you reduce waste and improve product quality and all those kind of things, but it's not like saving people's vision, right? So it's all great stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll just point at you when you change the slide. How's okay. That? <laughs> yeah, it falls asleep. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Then I skip a slide. I don't need to. So next slide. Uh, Ken. Yes. I'm, I'm I don't think I get it, but CVS provides the service now, and you're stepping away from this this uh, technology before try requiring a person to approve the diagnosis. They, that part is, is yeah. They out. still require a person to to overread or what look at. So I go to CVS and they say, "Yeah, you got a problem. What what happens next?" Well, you go to your ophthalmologist so or your, your yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. okay, now there's a lot of things I did at ORNL that I really enjoyed. In fact, I enjoyed everything that I did there from research to management to everything, but this was kind of a special thing, so I thought I'd throw it up here at the end. Don't worry about the math too much. Um, when I was doing my PhD at the University of Virginia, I was working in computational imaging around neutron radiography. And I was using something called coded apertures. And a coded aperture was like a, a pinhole camera. You remember the old brownie camera? Yeah. It's a very simple thing. Well, if you wanted to get more light in that camera, you had to make the aperture bigger. If you made the aperture bigger, then you made the image blurry. So the signal noise versus signal, you know, that was always a trade-off, right? A coded aperture is a particular kind of a pinhole camera. And that's what this is. That has, it's defined, its resolution is defined by the smallest feature here. If you think about that little black dot as being a hole, but its collection efficiency is defined by the number of holes. So it has a very, you know, it have, can have a very large area. You can collect a lot of, uh, in this case, neutrons through it, um, and, but you can get resolution that's very high based on the, the, the holes. There. And it's a, it's a challenging technique to use uh, for, for various reasons. But, and historically the way it worked, when I did my research, it was this way. So people developed these cameras to look at gamma stars. They used to set them up, on uh, hot air balloons in the upper atmosphere, they point them at the sky and they try to find out where gamma ray stars were you know, in space, right? So you needed to be able to collect as much uh, gammas as you could, um, but still have some resolution so you could identify where in space they were. Well, when I was doing this research, you had a neutron beam that shined on an object or you had a radioactive object, either way. And then you put your lens over here, your aperture over here, and stuff that would scatter off of it would hopefully go through the lens and you would collect it and try to determine something about the structure, that, that type of thing, of, of that object. Well, <clears throat> that was what I did my PhD work on. Many years later, when I was uh, still a division director 
Uh, the group that I led for 17 years was now being led by uh, uh, Philip Bingham, a fellow named Philip Bingham, who's still there. He's a section head of the lab today. Um, I was talking with him one day and I said, I've been doing some math and I did go through this because we're trying to work with the, the neutron sciences folks more out of my division. Um, we had an opportunity to work with the new cold guide hull beams over high flux isotope reactor called CG1D in particular. And um, we said, you know what? I think there's an opportunity for us to get past this process of looking orthogonally or sideways to the object, but doing it in transmission. If we put the aperture here where the beam is, and then the recorder here, as opposed to um, the aperture here and the recorder here, I think you get a lot more signal. You could get very inform uh, interesting information about your object, and you could do it in a way that is unprecedented for neutrons because you've got a limitation to the uh, the resolution that you can achieve because it's usually a function of the size of the detectors that are in your in your your your, your camera, the thing that you're looking at the neutrons with. Um, but when you do this, now it becomes a, a function of the size of that that hole, and so. <clears throat> We proposed this, and I worked with Philip. Next slide, please. <laughs> and we went back to the LDRD committee. We said, hey, we've got a great idea. And we're working with the neutron folks, and we want to try and set ourselves up so that Philip Bingham could win a five-year early career award from the Department of Energy Office of Science to do this sort of advanced imaging work with neutrons. Um, so we wrote a proposal to the LDRD committee. We got to work on that. We also, and I like to do this because I'm, I'm always thinking about patents. I was able to patent this idea too. It was unique. You know, instead of having the source and the aperture and the detector, let's put the aperture here and the detector here, and it's unique. Nobody's done that. Nobody's published on that. And that was the case. I was surprised about it after, you know, 20 eight years or something of research and working with with it with vision with a, a computer vision working with a neutron book working with whatever but nobody had done that so it's not a very profitable patent but the whole idea that it was unique and could be represented by a patent i thought was cool and you know so this is work that i had started in in, in 1984 five six seven for my phd and i was able to expand that many 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 years later to do something with vision. and so next slide There you go. And so there's Philip Bingham up there. So um, because of that, that Seed Buddy Award and because of the work that we're doing with uh, folks at SNS, we were able to uh, help them position himself and win an early career award from basic energy sciences. And so this is just an example here. So this is a wafer type material, like a silicon wafer, and printed on top of it are a number of different things. That, that wheel in the middle is just a resolution target. But these other, other squares that you see here, these are various um, resolutions of coded apertures. And so we use for neutrons, gadolinium. Uh, and there are some other interstitial layers that help the gadolinium stay on. But we were able to make a whole bunch of different apertures, different sizes, build it, the heavy lifting on this with a lot of folks from the Center for Nanophase Material Science and working with Hyper and everything else. Um, and he won that five-year program, which really was, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to win one of those early career awards. And throughout a lot of my career, we didn't necessarily do a lot of Department of Energy work. We did some, but, you know, we weren't part of the material science or the biosciences or the neutron sciences, the INC and the Electrical Electronic Systems Research Division and those kind of things. They were sort of not jack of all trades, but we could uh, approach problems uh, from a lot of different directions, but we didn't, we weren't owned by anybody in the Department of Energy. So for a, a guy that was in a, uh, an instrumentation division to win a five-year early career award was really great, really great. But so what you can see, this is, if I, this is an example, it's a, it's a very small screw, 16 millimeters long. And if you put it right on the detector and just took a picture of it, that was the highest resolution that detector could give you for that screw with neutrons. <clears throat> and you can see it's, you know, not great, but I blow that up so it's comparable to these. Um, you can see it's not very good resolution. But then you can see as, as they were uh, built, was developing more and more mass, uh, 200 micron holes, 100 micron holes, 50 micron holes, et cetera. You can see that you get stupendous resolution on that particular object. Um, now, there's a lot of pictures like this that I have that look at 
these targets, the resolution targets and stuff, but they're not as interesting as saying, oh, I understand that. There's an object that is blurry, and that one looks a whole lot better. So it was very successful from that perspective. And so uh, one more. So this led to some other stuff, which I was able to do. I, 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 I didn't design this thing by any means, but I was able to work with the, uh, uh, the Neutron folks, especially once Philip was, was working on that five-year early career award. I was division leader. I was working with folks. Um, they were interested in developing new instruments for SNS. And what SNS did not have, and almost doesn't have yet, but, but they're, they're getting close, is a um, uh, sort of an engineering instrument for, for neutron imaging, for doing computer tomography, for doing scattering experiments, for doing all sorts of things that can tell you about material properties and characterize materials in an engineering sense. A lot of the instruments that are up at the Spallation Neutron Source are very material oriented. They're looking at very fundamental properties of materials, the way neutrons scatter and things like this. Um, they did not have an engineering instrument um, other than Vulcan, which is, which is another instrument, but it's a pencil beam that looks through materials to measure the engineering properties around stress and strain and things like this. But they didn't have an imaging instrument. So we were able to get engaged with them because we had this uh, imaging work that we were doing uh, I was able to work with um, uh, a number of universities and organizations that were interested in doing imaging up at SNS. And ultimately, before I left the lab, it did lead to approval from BES and others to build a, a neutron imaging instrument up there. It's called Venus. Um, it is supposed to be completed now in 2024. It was supposed to be 2023. I haven't talked to them lately to kind of figure out what the what's taking a little bit longer. But it's a it's a complicated process. So this is a time of flight neutron imaging system. And because it's time of flight, that means that you can look at neutron energies. So you can look at an object at different, different neutron energies. And that tells you a lot of things about the material and the properties. Um, so the stress strain, magnetic properties, a lot of things that you can tell from this that you can't tell from a, uh, what I'll call a white neutron beam that you would see at something like CG1, or the high flux isotope reactor. So really unique. Supposed to be online in 2024. I will be up there first to see it once they get there. But I was able to work on that before I kind of got out of the technical aspect of things at the laboratory. So uh, one more slide on ORNL that I'm going to switch to ORU. How are we doing on time? Would you like me to wrap up at one o'clock or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Talk me that. So I, I, I put this together for those postdocs. It's like a snapshot of my career. I don't know if it's interesting to you or not, but I thought it was interesting when you looked at it. You know, you can read a CV. It's very hard to get all the stuff out of it. But this kind of shows when I started, where I came from, when I became a group leader and a corporate research fellow, uh, when I became a division director, uh, when I started the company, Hubble Telemedical, when I changed divisions, I became the director for the reactor and systems division. Then I moved into the Institute for Planning to help with that process at the laboratory. And then when I retired in 2020 and I moved to or you. But the kind of fun stuff. So these are, if you look at like Google Scholar and you look at people's publications, um, <clears throat> so these these are not numbers of publications. These are the number of publications of mine that people cited. How many times people cited my publications? And so you can see, you know, early on, nobody nobody looked at my work. Later on, some people looked at it and it grew and grew and grew. And you can see it kind of peaked out here in the mid 2000s. And of course, now it's starting to, to peter out because I don't do research anymore and I'm not publishing really anything new. Um, but you can you can kind of see that. Then you can see when the patents showed up. There was two here, one here, four here, three here, whatever. So you can kind of see the patent history as well overlaid there. And then uh, those awards that, that uh, you were talking about. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see when those happen. But, you know, I got to become a fellow of SPIE around 2001, um, fellow of IEEE in 2012. And, uh, I uh, was just actually it's this year the award ceremony is next month. I was elected to be a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. Anyway, so I thought that was just like a nice snapshot of my whole career. I could have just showed you that and we could have moved on, but <laughs> I'm going to show you the other stuff. Uh, next slide. Okay, so retired from ORNL 2020, had an opportunity to take Arlene Garrison's position. Uh, she was the vice president for university partnerships at ORU in 2020. Like uh, I retired in, in April and I started working in May. So I had about a month's retirement. I'll get better the next time. I will. 
Um, so I've been in a race yet. So um, not only did I, uh, I start there in, in, in uh, the spring of 2020 as the vice president for the university partnerships, but fairly soon after that, within about six months, a fellow named Eric Abelquist, who was the uh, senior vice president for research at ORU and the university partnerships was under him, he decided to retire. So Andy Page asked me if I would take his job plus my job and put them together and get paid the same amount. And I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. Because the other part of the job was to really look at the, the sort of research elements of ORU and how we could maybe expand them in a reasonable way, right? ORU is not a research organization. It's kind of a service organization, but it's very strong in science and technology, has been forever. And you know we, we need to think about those kind of things. So that's part of my job, and I'll get into that in a second. But you're familiar with ORU. We just, uh, we're, I think this is year 76. This year, uh, since it started, here's the Oak Ridge Institute for um, Nuclear Studies back in 1946. Uh, we've got almost 1,000 employees today, about a $409 million annual revenue, which is good. Over COVID, we were down to about 380 something million. Um, it's been four years, maybe five since we broke 400, but we're going to be about 409 million this year. So we've got some growth. That's a good thing. We're all over the country, really. Um, um, mostly in Oak Ridge here, we have people in um, Nevada, Colorado, in Bell Camp, Maryland, in Washington, D.C., Huntsville, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia, and just a lot of different places. Uh, but those are our main clusters, those five. Uh, we do work with a lot of different agencies, not just the Department of Energy, but they are our biggest, biggest supporter. And, um, and we have a consortium, which I'll talk about in just a second. And this piece, you're familiar with ORI's, Overage Institute for Science and Education. Um, it's our biggest contract, and we've managed that for the Department of Energy for ever, for a very long time. And this piece, it, it, it always wows people. And when I first heard this, I saw this number, you know, we're, we're almost at 10,000 participants annually that we place at DOE labs, federal laboratories, in federal agencies. Um, so the, you think about uh, having an impact on, on, on STEM, uh, STEM education and moving people in the STEM fields into those areas that are important to the nation. Um, ORIS just does a fantastic job of that. So I always like to bring that up. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at my office, Research and University Partnerships Office, um, I, I put us kind of underneath of all of our major areas for the work that we do. And, you know, I just mentioned the, the workforce development and the participant programs and the scientific assessment and peer review and things that we do. We also have this, these incredible capabilities doing things like independent um, radiological verification of, of radiological sites. We do work for um, um, radiation emergency training and, and uh, assessment. We do work in health studies, looking at things like a beryllium exposure in the DOE complex population or, or, or radiological exposures to plutonium and, and uh, uranium and things like this. And we just do so many things across the board in the company with so many different agencies. But we're not a research organization, but we need to have research capabilities, right? Because a company that has strong research, they have um, the ability to uh, uh, create new mechanisms and methods and be more responsive to our customers. That gives us the ability to uh, be more attractive to the caliber of people that we want to bring in to work at the company. It allows us to keep people at our company because they're doing interesting and challenging things. Um, and, it, and it builds new capabilities, capabilities that we may not have already had. And so that's what part of my job is, work across the organization um, with our universities, because our universities, we have 153, I'll talk about that in a second, but they provide also capabilities and opportunities for partnerships that help bring their capabilities into the laboratory, their facilities into the laboratory or into ORU to work with us uh, on, on collaborative opportunities and, and, and things. So, um, and of course, lots of agencies. So the, the real point I'm going to make here was that my office really kind of looks over the research elements for the whole company. Now, when I came into the company, <clears throat> we didn't really track what aspects of our work was research. Um, it's about 4% of our work. So it's 15, $16 million a year of our program work is really got a research flavor to it. I think it needs to be 10%. And so I have set targets working with the, with the organization and the other uh, executive VPs and such to grow our research to 10%. So we have organizational goals 
We're working with principal investigators, we're working with program managers to figure out how we can increase that to 10% over the next five years so that we can be more impactful as a company and what we do is unique and provides value and that kind of thing. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'm also, and I mentioned the universities, but I'm uh, also working with Kathy Ford, who's our senior director for university partnerships. Now, many of you might've met Kathy Ford. She's been in the, the complex here for many, many years. She worked at my 12, she worked at ORNL, she worked at ORU, um, kind of like me without the Y12. Um, and so what we have today is a, a consortium of 153 universities, uh, 128 of them are, are R1, R2, PhD grading uh, university members, 25 of them are associate members. Um, associate members are just small universities. They have graduate programs, they have masters and PhDs, but they're not R1 or R2 universities, but they want to get there. So we, we bring those universities in to work with us as well. We're in 37 states around the country. Um, we've grown, I think when I started uh, in 2020, we had about 143, we're about 153 now. And um, um, our universities are top-notch universities. So there are uh, 100 of them are listed in the, uh, the NSF top 200 R&D expenditures uh, universities in the country. So it's a, it's a great, great organization that we can leverage, bring together to, to solve problems. And we have a lot of value that we provide to those universities. I don't want to spend a lot of time going through all these, but very important things that we do, <laughs> early career awards. Um, we do work with the universities, kind of like the LDRD program um, at the labs or the uh, PDRD program at Y12. Um, it's called the ORU Directed Research Development. We don't have as much money as they do, but um, we help our PIs get engaged and involved in research, but they have to work in partnership with the university. So we can fund about four of these a year. Um, and they come together, they do a collaborative thing, they publish papers on the work they do, they, they come together and go after business development with our federal sponsors and businesses that we work with. Anyway, there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff that we do uh, with our universities to add value to them, and as well as to bring them in to work with us collaboratively to help us uh, develop our research capabilities and, and have more impact. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really important, what we're doing right now, is um, it's not just the sort of what I call philanthropic stuff like Pow Grants and ODRD where we you know fund our universities to do some projects, but we're actually bringing our universities in to work with us collaboratively on proposals to go after new work. Um, so you've all seen the, um, the Oak Ridge Enhanced Technology Training Center down the road, the Ordic facility, and uh, we are working with um, folks over there uh, to help. We help them establish a um, steering committee to help drive the activities that are taking place there. And uh, we reached out to our universities and some of the folks that are in the national security business side to help form that committee. We're also working with them on their PDRD investments. They're trying to bring more universities in from a broader uh, a swath of, of universities and you know just the ones in the local Southeast region to um, bring in new ideas and thought to Y-12. And so it's an example of where we, we were reaching out to our universities to help bring them in to, 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 to add value to them as well as to our industry partners. And there's just a number of things here. I won't go through them all right now, but, uh, and there's a lot more than this. These are just sort of uh, examples of the kinds of things that we're doing with our universities. So there's a lot of value that we add to our universities that are part of our consortium. I think I have one more slide. So the other question that I, question. Yes. If, if a university wanted to join ORAL, what is the procedure they would go through to become a part of ORAL? Uh, so an arbitrary university or something. Yeah. So typically, um, we get um, recommendations for a university to join from one of our existing universities. But, uh, for example, if we're doing some sort of a project and we need somebody that has uh, experience in cancer, we could actually reach out to a university and say, we'd like to work with you on this proposal and all that. And, oh, by the way, would you consider joining our consortium? And if they say yes, um, we only bring on new members once a year, but we have a council of sponsoring institutions that have to vote. So they put it in an application. Um, <clears throat> that application is reviewed by the, the entire consortium, and there's a vote that we take. And if they vote them in, then they become a member at the next annual meeting. And if they don't vote them in, then they don't. So it's a, it's a year-long process. I'd like to speed that up a little bit. It's maybe twice a year, but we haven't gotten there yet. So, uh, And it's just a matter of bylaws and history and things like that. But I'll squash that soon enough. So I'm just kidding. Um, so there's there's a way. It's it's and it's, and like I said, we 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 have about two or three applicants every year that come in and are, are generally accepted. 
we have about one or two that drop out for various reasons. You know, they don't feel like they're getting the value or something has changed in their program area, you know, that kind of thing. But overall, it's been steady, steady growth of two, two to three a year um, over time. So the last slide here um, was just, uh, I was asked to kind of talk about the relationship between ORNL and ORE. And of course, this is a partnership that goes all the way back to the Manhattan Project. Um, and so I, I just listed, I just went back to 1990. These are all programs that are still in place today that ORU executes with ORNL to help be successful. So they're, they're, um, a lot of these are participant type programs like Nestles and Suli and GEM. And, um, um, and, and we have other, other kinds of things that we're doing with them as well. I mean, just an example, if you recall reading about the Institute for Advanced Deposit Manufacturing Innovation called IACME, it's a UT program, but ONL really started that program. And it's a hub and spoke kind of a thing where there, there are universities all over the country um, and manufacturers that are working with the IACME folks. We've done a lot of work, uh, not just in IACME, but IACME is an example where we brought in Mississippi State students who needed to be able to work in the advanced manufacturing environment. We helped provide certifications and work with Mississippi and others to do that. We've done similar kinds of things with the carbon fiber facility at ONL with the Advanced Manufacturing Facility or the MDF, Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. And there's just so many different things that continue to go on um, today. And I actually, um, over the last uh, uh, couple of months, and this is gonna carry on into the summer, I've been going back out there now that COVID is well passed and things are settling down at the lab a little bit. And I've been meeting with a lot of the associate laboratory directors who are people I knew as group leaders or division directors, and now they're all, associate lab directors. <laughs> and so I'm meeting with them kind of for the first time in their ALD role, you know, sort of reintroduce them to ORU and the kinds of work and things that we've done with them in the past. And so it's been a very, very, very positive uh, interaction. And I have several more of those that are that are going on for the early part of the summer. Here. That's it. And I can start off. I'm on the uh, Zoom session, David Fields. So keeping it out, the uh, participants it bounce around between 15 and 20. So thank you so much for the presentation. I have a question. And, and of all the interesting and eclectic things you covered, the uh, coded source microscopy is intriguing. Many times it seems when we, we discover or innovate, we find an, an analog in nature and we say, whoa, look at that. This was done. Is this such a case? Is there a, a coded source analog in uh, natural systems, except that we're natural systems too, maybe? In natural systems, so I, you know, I could think of a compound eye on a, on a fly as an example of a way to try to keep information yet get a lot of signal type of thing. Uh, that type of thing. Um, of course, the, the density of, of, of color and monochromatic sensors that are in any animal's eyes, you know, some animals are more tuned to night vision than others. And it's because the sensors are more dense, there's more of them, and they have more processing neurology to handle them and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, that's probably the only analog I can think of right now. Um, you know, the, the process that you have to use to deconvolve a coded aperture, if you think about the coded aperture, it's got so many pinholes that when you take a picture, you're really taking a picture of thousands of pinhole pictures that are overlapping each other. And so you have to unwrap that and unfold that. And when I talk about computational imaging, that's what I'm referring to. It's a technique where, you know, if you looked at the native data, you wouldn't know what you were looking at, but if you can unfold it, you can see what that is. Computational imaging is also associated with things like computer tomography, right? If you look at scans that you, you take from a CT machine, you don't see a cross-section of a, of a person's body, but when you reconstruct it, you do. And so uh, for a coded aperture, you have to do that kind of reconstruction. And of course, some animals, you, know, you do a lot of things in your mind, especially even in the human right now, the way you detect edges and motion and understand the vision, uh, the world that you see, there's a lot of things that happen all the way through the, the, the optical process, right? Not just in the brain, but in the retina itself starting there. So I don't know if there's a, a direct analog to coded apertures in the natural world, but there's a lot of things that the natural world does to be more sensitive, more highly resolved in the way it, it images and sees the world. Does that answer your question? It did. It did. The compound eye is, uh, is probably a good example of that, but the comments are really enlightening. So thank you again. You're welcome. Any questions here? 
Now, when you're talking about retinal imaging uh, and doing it at the CBS Minute Clinic, yeah, I was thinking about the problem that you've got to dilate people's eyes. There, there's a lot of stuff that goes on besides right. taking the image. So there, are, there's some interesting issues that uh, um, seems like that there's. The medical profession needs to be modified to deal with the ability to get high quality things like high quality images. Yes. For people who are going to have to have medications that they're not normally receiving in that kind of setting. Uh, are, are you aware of issues related to that sort of thing? Sure. So, the dilating of the pupil is, is a great example. Um, there are, as cameras get better um, and the sensitivity of the cameras get better, there, there's a whole class of, of the retina is also called the fundus, so they're called fundus cameras. There's a whole class of fundus cameras that are called non metriatic cameras, and they don't require dilation. If you still put someone in a dark room or a darker room, you know, not in the sunlight or anything, um, but you can get good signal, high quality images out of uh, uh, non metriatic cameras for fundus imaging. So that's that's an issue that they, they uh, whether or not you have an automatic technique to try and analyze the data or not. Even just the ophthalmologist or the optometrist or whoever's looking in your eye, um, they they need to see good high quality imagery too. And so the non metriatic camera was already something that was on the frontier. And I believe that small camera that I showed you that um, this this company had created it was I believe a non metriatic camera as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ken, there's a question from Carolyn Krauss, very timely. What is your perspective on AI now that it is somewhat controversial in the public sphere? Well, AI has been around forever. Um, so we talked about AI back in the 80s and 90s. And, and the thing that makes AI powerful today, it's not that we have algorithms that can do pattern recognition and make decisions about things like manufacturing or whatever. It's that we have high speed networks, we have cloud computing, we have edge devices, which simply means you have a, a little sensor that's in your phone. You have dozens of sensors in your phone, as a matter of fact. They can communicate at high speeds and all the time, and you can collect terabytes of information from a population, not to mention what you do socially online and things like this. So the scary part about AI is what people or companies or algorithms are trying to do with your private information or personal information or you know those kinds of things. And so the only thing that's really different today, it's not that the technology exists because it's existed for many, many years. It's the fact that it has access to very high speed networks, very high speed computing power, very distributed computing. All those things are the newer things and very low cost, right? Everybody has a phone. Everybody has a car with a OnStar in it, maybe. Everybody um, spends time on social media, giving away all their information, buying things, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where AI becomes a problem. Bob? Uh, yeah, I had a question about um, identification of, of, of materials, let's say. So if I took a mass spectrum or something, I would get a bunch of peaks. Yeah. If I do a mass spectrum of a bunch of blobs, I would get a bunch of peaks. Right. Or if I do an infrared spectrum of one molecule, I get a piece that's well known. And then if I've got a bunch of molecules, it will be like this. So have a Robin spectrum, whatever. Yeah. So I wonder if, if you have applied this technology you're talking about to identify from a large number of molecules how much of each one of them are there, what's there, and how much. That's a challenging problem. There's a lot of work. I would have thought it'd been easy, but maybe. <laughs> no, no, it's really not. Not when you have a complicated compound that you're yeah, that has yeah. many different molecules in it, different distributions, uh, things like this. So I, I have not worked on that problem, but I know people at the laboratory who have worked on that problem for uh, using gas chromatographs and uh, mass spectrometers and you know other Raman spectroscopy and other kinds of things that all look at a molecule or a sample in different ways, right? There's different phenomena they're, they're measuring. Many, many of these applications, though, you know sort of what's there, but yeah. they're beginning to use Raman on um, in, in the NASA's and space and Mars and places to test on. And they sort of know what's there. So you have maybe 10 molecules that you need to know how much of each one. Yeah. 
and I and I think that's how the problem is addressed a lot. In semiconductor industry, they do the same thing. When you have a defect that you find, you want to know what it's made of. And there's a limited number of materials that are in the manufacturing process that could be there. So that does sort of uh, focus the scope of what you have to identify. This is a big deal. It, it really is. It really is. But same sorts of benefits. That, so the machine learning, the AI, that's what they're doing. Trying to separate those beams, by chain quantities. Yes, we certainly optimize the opportunities that you had going through your career. Uh, how do you assure that others can follow your footsteps, uh, having that kind of ability? To yeah. So the, um, I think the thing that made my career successful in my my mind was the the uh, the feeling of entrepreneurial, you know, effort that I wanted to put into things. I like the idea of making something new. I like the idea of getting a patent more than I like the idea of getting a publication. But I published a lot of stuff too. But really, it was the sort of the mentoring that mattered. Like I mentioned, Phil Bingham up there, who you know he's a section head out there now. He did great work, not because of me, but because we worked together to try and put our heads together on new ideas and new processes that you know would, would allow us to be to excel. But you know, one of us had to have an idea. One of us had to pull somebody in. By the time he was working on that early career award, I was way past my early career opportunity window, right? So. But I've, I've been able to do that type of thing, especially as a division director, to work with staff, to put them in positions, especially when they show that they have the talent or the, the desire to, um, to, to lead projects, to, uh, to, uh, to win LDRD projects. Well, you know, that was my model for a lot of people, and I've shared that with a lot of people. When you have a company that's willing to give you seed funding to create something, take advantage of it. Every time you have a good idea, take advantage of it. But you got to take it further, too. Otherwise, you don't get any more of that seed money, right? You got to try to invest it and get more and write proposals, and win, win funding and things like that. But those are the kinds of examples uh, you have to set through the mentoring opportunities and career development opportunities. And so I, that, that's really the key, especially you know, at this point in my career, when I talk about what I'm doing at ORU, there's a, there's a lot of people at ORU who are kind of early to mid-career, who are very technically capable, doing great work, and I'm trying to provide them with opportunities to grow that into new things. So at my age, at my career level, I'm not doing research, I'm not publishing papers, but I'm trying to help people understand what they need to do to get there. And that's that's the best I can do at this point. Yeah. Great question. Another is just a follow up here. Uh, it seems that uh, your, your example of jumping from semiconductors and using that technology of imagery and then going jumping into the medical field, and, yeah. uh, retinopathy. What would happen if you had more of a social science impact on this? Because some of the concepts would also attack or uh, elucidate some of the ills that society has, especially with AI, uh, and me dealing with the phone and the isolation that seems to be pervading society today. Yeah, um, that's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. I don't know the answer to. I do know there are a lot of folks at ORL, for example, working in the computational sciences area, and people that I knew when I was there too, who are working with all that social data, especially if you you know just analyzing something like um, like uh, Twitter feeds, right, around topics that come up, and trying to understand how they blew up or where they're progressing to or what were the outcomes because people had these this exposure and these decisions that were made that that's a very big area that i'm not as familiar with i'm really an imaging guy i love looking at images and understanding images and automating that and that kind of thing but those sort of processes apply to things beyond you know physical spatial things that i've been interested in i think we need to wrap this up uh, we've been going to for 15 minutes on questions. If you have a question, why don't you come up af afterwards? Let's let's thank I can for a fine talk and, and also thank you for all the people who were on Zoom. And I hope to see you uh, on June the 6th, which is one week sooner than you have expected in the past. Thank you again. I was in the where you got my PhD in the lab. Yeah. yeah. So,